Greetings everyone, I'm Mar. Once again, this is my opinion. As you can tell from the title, I am continuing my Faulty Tower reviews. We are now on the first episode of Season 2, Communication Problems. And this aired about four years after the end of the previous season, which, when you look at it from a more modern perspective, is unthinkable. Especially from an American television perspective. You're like, four years? No, 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 no. The audience can't wait that long. No. But creatively and visually, it doesn't really seem like too much time has passed. And most of these episodes, with few exceptions, you can kind of air out of order. There's like a couple references here or there. I'd say probably between season one and season two, you'd have to air them a little bit more in the season order. And then watch them out of order. But especially since this episode introduces a new character for the hotel. But you can always go with the thing, oh, he's just off screen. Now, of course, some shows here in America now are doing the whole not a season every year, such as Rick and Morty, so not as uncommon now, but it's one of those things you're like, really? I don't know if it was more a thing for BBC television to get away with that, but it doesn't feel like anything is missed a step, creatively speaking. Off screen, the only major change is in the interim between seasons, John Cleese and Connie Booth divorced. Their marriage fell apart after 10 years. And watching on screen doesn't really seem like much has happened. And from what I've read up of his ex-wives, Connie seems to be the one he's still on friendly terms with, which makes sense. I mean, they had a daughter, so they had that to consider. And also them still working here shows that even though their marriage may have fallen apart, they could still work together. As the episode begins, it seems to be just an average day at Faulty Towers. We see Sybil talking on the phone, Paulie's working the desk. And then we are introduced to Mrs. Richards, the character that leads to the titular problem, played by Joan Sanderson, who was a good friend of John Cleese, and he specifically wrote the role for her. Now, from the word go, you could tell, like, oh, she's going to be one of them characters. Because even though the phrase didn't exist, Mrs. Richards is a Karen. She even pulls the let me see your manager card. She's a very shrewish woman the type of character you just want to reach through the tv and strangle and i can tell you work in security this is the type of guest that the moment i would walk up, i'd walk up on and have to talk with her and be like mentally be like oh great it's one of these people and then no matter what you say they always think they're right they're going to try to get their way no matter what it's one of those ones that <laughs> at times you wish you could pull an uncle phil on throw him out and you really do get that vibe from the characters when they're dealing with her too. And I do like that Basil does actually throw some stuff back at her. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. She comes in. She starts talking with Polly. And part of this communication problem is the fact she has a hearing aid that she doesn't turn on. Because she's like, the battery will run down. And the moment I heard that, I chuckled. And I'm also thinking, really? You are going to make it to where you can barely hear people. Because you don't want the battery to run down. Uh, Mrs. Richards, you might want to have this tested because here's the thing. When you have a hearing aid, you're supposed to use it. Using it runs the battery down. That's why you have more than one battery. Well, that's a common sense solution, but she doesn't seem to be the type that would go that. She'd probably be like, batteries are expensive. Like, oh, that's the car. That's the price of hearing. Uh, she keeps getting a little snippy with Basil and all that, haggle, wanting to haggle about the price when she sees her room, stating, it, you know, this room does not have a view, a bath and all that. And Basil does throw stuff back at her. It's like, this is to this is Torquay. That is a Torquay view. There's the sea. And you can really see that Basil really is getting fed up with her. And she's going to be one of those problem guests. Or, as they call them at Disney, treasured guests. Well, to add to this, Mrs. Richards eventually says... That she is missing money from her room. It's 85 pounds if I'm remembering the amount correctly. He's saying that means someone must have gone into her room and taken it. She's blaming the staff of course. Because they're the ones that have keys to the room. Which means it had to have been Polly, Manuel, or the new cook character. Terry the chef played by Brian Hall. Or of course one of the faulties. But they are obviously denying it. And, then, and she wants the police call. They of course don't want to get the police involved. They say we're going to just search the rooms. Which, of course, is a very English thing in the 1970s, because 
now searching the rooms. It's like maybe here in America. I don't know how what the flip with that would be. And yeah, they know housekeeping you can go in there if you let them, but it's like I think there's a difference between housekeeping going in to clean and entering the room to search it while it's still rented to a guest. I don't know if that might be like local jurisdictional issues and all that while the room is being rented to them. That is, once they're checked out, it's like, hey, if you leave anything illegal in the room, that's on you. You leave money in the room, that's on you. You got to claim it within the time, but that's a whole other can of worms. Now. To add to this little thing with her missing money, at the same time, Basil has come into a good little windfall. As we've seen in previous episodes, one thing he likes to do on occasion is gamble. And at this point, which it doesn't mention in the episode at all of in the universe of the show, which takes place four years later, as in like real time, but Basil is trying not to gamble, maybe mainly because Sybil is putting her foot down with it. Well, I guess it's checking out. Tells him about a horse that he has heard good things about. So he decides to put down five pounds on the horse. And he ends up winning. And he gets away with 75 pounds. And he's all happy giddy that he won. And he, like, you know, tell him Man he, he had Manuel go place the bet and come back with it. So Manuel's in on it. Polly's in on it because he wants to, you know, like, hide this. Don't tell her. She's counting it. Sybil sees her counting, but at that moment thinks nothing of it. But she starts to think something of it when Mrs. Richards reports her money. I think now you can see where these two plots are starting to connect. And then when Sybil brings it up later, Basil's like, oh, crap. And he tries to hide the money. He hides it with the Major. He hides it other places. He's trying to make it seem like it's Polly's money that she won on the race. Telling Manuel, do not mention anything about the horse race to anybody. Which eventually comes back to bite him in the butt later. Ends up having to give the money to Mrs. Richards when it's found out. And in the end, Sybil does find out that Basil won at the horse race. They end up having to give most of the money to Mrs. Richards because something of hers gets broken. But the fun thing about it is, even though he lost most of the money, in the end, Basil still walks away with more money than he originally invested because he invested five pounds at the end of it. When you look at all the math involved, he walks away with ten pounds. So it's still a little bit of a windfall for him, but just not as much as before. So instead of being like super giddy, it's like... It's like if you buy a... Five dollar scratcher and you walk away with ten bucks. It's like, all right, you made your money back, but it's not like a whole lot. The acting in the episode is pretty good. Cleese, all always excellent as Basil Fawlty, and seeing him having to interact with Mrs. Richards, you you could tell that even when he is trash talking her, he is restraining himself. And with her little hearing aid thing, he's also he is malicious in what he says and he is exploiting the situation perfectly he's when he's giddy about winning the money he really plays it off well his frustration and despair at the end when he has to give up most of the money you really feel it you feel it in your wallet when he has to hand over that money uh, all the other characters prunella as uh, sybil to her usual self but you could tell when she's trying to connect the dots without all the information you, just, you could see the stuff that's running in her head real quickly. And Connie Booth's still excellent as Polly. Uh, with her, in this episode, they introduce another little character trait, and that's that she's a little short of money. And that's why she agreed to pick up extra hours. And it ties back in again to why she would steal the money from Mrs. Richards. So he's like, hey, she's short of money. Some money's missing from her room. I saw her counting money. Hmm, I wonder. I'm going to go talk with Polly about it. Andrew Sachs is Manuel. He's excellent. I think my favorite moment of him is at the end where uh, Basil is trying to get Manuel to say, you know, you know, the horse, the horse thing. And the way that Andrew plays this off, it looks like Manuel is taking a little bit of a perverse joy in the fact that he gets to tell Basil he knows nothing. Because even if he cannot tell that Basil is actually trying to get him to at least open up, the way it comes off, Manuel is like, I know nothing, and walks away. Even though Basil is basically on his knees begging, if only metaphorically begging, for Manuel to tell. It just, just Andrew plays it perfectly. And of course, Joan as Mrs. Richards, perfect. Like I said, the role was written by John Cleese for her. They were friends for a while. 
And Joan, uh, according to IMDb, was reluctant to take the role initially because the character of Mrs. Richards was the complete polar opposite of her personality. But apparently that is why John was very keen on her playing it because he knew, one, she's a great actress so she can pull it off. And two, her having to pull off a character, her complete opposite, would be good. And that's a good thing from an acting perspective that if it's a character close to you, it's easy to play. And I mean, there's a reason why the the phrase, even though I hate it, they're just playing themselves exists because some people think that. Whereas I think that that is more an example of the actor being typecast to the point we look at their per, their screen personas as their actual selves and not themselves. But that's another that's a topic for another video. Now with her, go, when you have to go to a character that's complete opposite, and you got the talent. And this, the writing's good, you let your talent shine, and boom. And in the case of Joan, it worked. Because she has she was great as an actress in this episode. And, like I said earlier, it's to the point that you want to reach through and strangle the character. And the way she holds herself, the way she inflects all her words, her body language when she's moving about, the way she interacts with the other cast members. This is an example of an episode that is really built on the strength of its guest star. And the way that the guest star interacts with the main cast. And it's an episode that uh, when I was going through this one, I really didn't remember watching it that much when I would rewatch the episodes on occasion. That's probably going to change now because this is a good episode and it's a perfect way to begin the second season. It's essentially just another one that's just a day in the life at Faulty Towers, but it's the day when they get a very, very obnoxious guest. Speaking of obnoxious. And Faulty Towers. Uh, the second episode is going to be another time where we see Basil in his upper crust, slightly conservative ways, uh, getting him into trouble when he is going to be trying to catch one of the guests in a very precarious situation in their room. It is the textbook definition of mind your own business. <laughs> 